Hello, and welcome to another fully live episode of Hacking with Friends. We're gonna be doing the Q&A again today. So if you are in the chat, then we are actually completely live today and we'll be answering your questions, both from the videos we've done previously left on the YouTube channel and also for anyone who's here in the chat. My name is Cody Kinsey. I am a security researcher at Veronis. And today we have our very special cryptozoology expert here, Michael, here to help answer any questions. Mm -hmm. So if you have any questions, again, cryptozoology has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, so we can't answer any questions about that. And Michael doesn't understand about uh, a lot about cryptography. However, if you have any cryptozoology related questions, please direct them Michael's way. Any hacking related questions, I'm happy to answer. So uh, yeah, thank All you right. for joining us today. And uh, we will be looking for great questions in the chat as well, although we have a couple already mm -hmm. pulled up that are ready to go. So. Uh, it's great to see um, some cool people like Not Sure in the chat and some nerds like Nick Godshaw in the chat as well. So good to see everyone here and let's go ahead and get started. All right. First question is um, about us doing a video on SecBSD. Yeah, I had never heard of this. Um, Mostly because there are so many operating mm -hmm. systems out there, especially smaller projects sometimes get overlooked. So. Let's take a look at it really quick. Um, go ahead and switch to my screen. And you can see, like, I went to the website to just see, like, oh, like, is this going to be another, like, very dry, documented project? That no. looks pretty cool. You're, you've got the, the cyber corvid over here. You've got this this guy jacked right. He's, he's, that looks some like sort some of quality scribble. matrix stuff. Yeah, I know. This looks like uh, DEF CON, like, 25 stuff, actually. Yeah. Like, the, I love the, the art. Um, it's really cool. But, all right, this is a little confusing. Um, SecBSD alpha testing phase is over. Okay. Can you uh, zoom in there a little? It's tiny. I mean, yeah. that's about what you get. Um, alpha testing is over. Okay, fair. No downloads available. What does that mean? But then it immediately lists, uh, is this a download? Can I download this? I don't, I guess not. I guess it's just a link. It doesn't go anywhere. But um, yeah, so that says, color scheme is also baffling to me. Maybe it's just my eyes, but it makes it harder to read. That's fine. I don't. I don't have an issue with it. it I mean, it's on black. So yeah. what's the problem? I don't know. That like blue or purple on the black. You don't do much work in a terminal, do you? No. 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 Okay. All right. Yeah. Like, you know, this this is hard to read. <laughs> like, if you want to talk about anything, yeah. like, you know, oh, yeah. lime green on uh, teal is not exactly like a, a friendly <laughs> color uh, scheme. But okay. So if I wanted to download this, um, it looks like I can't. It's just telling me there's no downloads available. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so to answer that question, I would love to check out SecBSD, but they won't let me. Yeah. Um, and if I were to download off of this off of like somewhere else, I don't know if someone has backdoored it or added something. So never, uh, never, if you can help it, run like a an image that you just download off of some website that's not the official website of Wait, that project. So Reddit that... told me to trust anything I downloaded off the internet. Wow, well, that's uh, great advice for people on Reddit. But for the rest of us, um, you really want to make sure you're downloading it from the original mm -hmm. source so that you can compare things like the hash and make sure it hasn't been modified. In this case, like, I don't see how I would do that. Mm -hmm. um, I also don't see that there's like a hash available. There probably was like back when this was open. But yeah, yeah I guess like maybe, maybe this will become a thing I can download, maybe not. But for now, it seems like their alpha phase is over. So yeah. I don't know if that just means they got bored of it um, or if they're moving on to a beta phase that will actually be open to people. But for now, it looks like I cannot. So sorry, would love to try it, but I can't. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Did we want to... So the, the, the Nick Godshaw, I think, had uh, a question. Oh. How realistic is <laughs> the Jackie G and the Italian job cause... Uh, causing the massive traffic jam. So we did do a reaction series where we actually reacted to that scene. Uh, but would you want to elaborate on kind of what we talked about there? Yeah, for sure. So <clears throat> in the hacking scene, um, we had a guy that basically got into a traffic control system and was able to uh, manipulate traffic to mm -hmm. benefit a criminal situation, I guess we'll say. So he was able to cause accidents, shut down uh, intersections. And is this actually realistic? Okay, well, there was an employee of uh, the city of Los Angeles who was per, like allowed to go into the traffic mm -hmm. system who was, I think he was like fired or, or locked out or for some reason they, they 
we're not letting him work. And he got really upset about this. And he went in and he started deliberately causing traffic in some of the worst parts of Los Angeles for traffic already. Mm -hmm. So he just like complicated a problem beyond all belief and really made things incredibly bad. So people didn't really understand what was happening at first, but then eventually uh, I believe he was arrested for hacking. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was a pretty big deal because it really affected a ton of people. And this guy being angry was something that uh, ended up having rippling effects across the city. So it just goes to show as technology increases its role in our lives in it. And things like streetlights are networked and tied into software that a bunch of people all have access to. You don't need to be like a hacker uh, in order to break in and manipulate stuff. You could just be an employee who wants money mm -hmm. or is angry. So in this case, it was just a, a malicious insider that caused the mm -hmm. damage, but it could just as easily be a phishing attack against you know the same group of people that control that stuff, and then a malicious outsider coming in and uh, doing the exact same thing. So I would say that's actually pretty realistic, although it would take a substantial mm -hmm. amount of resources to pull off, and you would also need knowledge of the way the system works. Uh, but once you have that, then it probably would not be that difficult. Yeah, um, and for <coughs> viewers, don't worry, uh, this is a recorded stream, so you can always watch it later. Um, and then I, do. Um, can you talk about cyber certs, uh, cyber security certs? Um, we, do, we used to have a stream on getting the CISSP, um, except Mike has gotten occupied with other stuff at the moment. Um, but we do have a stream on that. We've also done a number of streams um, on the various certs you can get and how valuable they are. Um, I don't know if you want to just briefly make Certifi a comment on yeah, that. Yeah, certifications are great because they for, for getting hired by people who might not understand how mm -hmm. to judge your technical skills right off the bat, they show that you have a certain level of competence that they can just expect. That being said, experience um, working, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of the chicken and the egg. But if you can show that you've worked in a cybersecurity setting before, it's kind of almost the same thing. If you can describe what you know how to do and, mm -hmm. and make sure that you have a specialty that they're looking for. Um, if you're doing more general cybersecurity work, uh, like you're an analyst or something, someone that needs to know a whole lot of stuff in one specific field, certifications that are targeted can be really good at letting people know that that's the area that you specialize in. But myself, like I don't have any certifications because I'm a generalist, mm -hmm. so I know a lot about Wi-Fi hacking stuff, I know a lot about OSINT stuff, and I know a, a good amount of, mm -hmm. about like electronics and um, Arduino and stuff like that. Outside of that, I don't do a lot of analysis. I don't do a lot of exploitation. I do more research work into Wi-Fi stuff. So there's a lot that I don't mm -hmm. know because I, I just don't work in that field, like bug bounties or, or right. things like that, which is are, are huge areas of cybersecurity. I just don't personally work there. So when it comes to certifications, it really is a choice. Like, do you need to demonstrate your base confidence to someone who might not understand how to, you know, figure that out? And if you don't have experience, that can be mm -hmm. a huge benefit to show that you've taken the time and energy to focus on this. But also, if you have other means of showing people that you know what you're doing, it might not be worth it. Yeah. Um, okay, let's go to... Um... Yeah, yeah, let's go to another question. Uh, so the next question from, is a critical question, which is who would you prefer to star in Ghost in the Shell instead of Scarlett <sighs> Johansson? Um, that's a great question. I would mm. say um, Lucy Lawless uh, would be great, or the actress that played uh, Ro Laren in Star Trek um, I think would also be great. Um, mm -hmm. I, want, I want to see like someone that looks kind of like, like a scary cyborg um, and someone who would like beat you up and you would die like because that's like the way mm -hmm. i feel like it was originally written so like making the character like smaller and smaller and like more like dancer like is like not exactly the way i envisioned it but who knows you know maybe mm -hmm. not everybody wants their cyborg heroine to look like a truck <laughs> okay but i uh, want to i want to see like a mac truck looking looking major in okay. the next ghost in the shell what is your day job is well, it it related but me? without certs ask him first um my day job is doing this. <laughs> basically, I also write uh, hacking articles um, and basically organize this stuff. What do you do? You yeah, do so, my, so my day job is more as a science communicator. Mm -hmm. So I work with other people who are good at explaining technology and making it feel and seem exciting to beginners um, to make educational material. And I do this with lots of different people. I mm -hmm. do this at Verona's here, making sure that we have the stream and other resources available for the community. And I also do it for Hack5, um, bringing up new creators and finding new people who are doing really excellent stuff who I feel like everybody would benefit from seeing. So um, my job is mostly in yeah making hacking exciting and producing mm -hmm. content around that. So 
again, I don't do a lot of IT related work because I'm mostly doing media kind of work, mm -hmm. but I will be reaching out to people who do you know, the IT related work and either featuring them directly as an expert or in learning from them when creating an episode. Or showing off their tools. Yeah, or, or showing off uh, really excellent tools the community has created. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, would we ever consider doing live CTFs? Yes. Yeah. No, absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's The problem is I do a lot of Wi-Fi stuff, and mm -hmm. um, everybody likes to be like, hey, I found your address because you leaked this one Mac address. I'm like, yes, I'm aware you can do that because I taught you to how to do that because <laughs> I featured it on Nullbyte. Yeah. So um, it gets a little annoying at some points to try to do a live CTF when like people just do that because mm -hmm. honestly, it just irritates me. Um, however, uh, there are CTFs we can do, and I think it would be really fun, especially some of the basic ones you know, mm -hmm. Michael could do. Um, and then I can teach some of the more advanced specialist ones on Wi-Fi hacking some, okay. some other time. Um, so yeah, I would love to do that, especially like Stefan and I are working on something that should allow mm -hmm. you to learn a little bit about brute forcing um, uh, services, a little bit about breaking into Wi-Fi, and it would be really, really cool if everybody could follow along while we do it. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of what we're trying to do, uh, because I don't do a lot of web application pen testing, but if Michael would like to learn you know, one yeah. of the basics, then... We well, um, something I have been thinking about having us do is like hack the box stuff and other um, web CTFs like that. So if y'all do want to see that, uh, certainly let us know. Live live is a little difficult sometimes because there might be things you want to blur. Yeah, um, you never, you never. As know. Cody was alluding to. Um, so those we might do in the like pre-recorded and then we air it <clears throat> and we're live in the chat kind of thing. Uh, but it certainly could be fun like all of us together collectively uh, figuring out a CTF. So that. We that would be that. great because a lot of you guys are a lot smarter than us and our whole goal is to mm. be surrounded by people who are smarter than us at different things that we just haven't had a chance mm -hmm. to get to learn. So it's really nice having a bunch of people from various backgrounds in the chat while we do stuff because a lot of you know a lot more about programming than I do. Um, any good courses on Active Directory hacking? Courses. I typically don't recommend courses I haven't taken, and I have not taken any courses mm -hmm. on Active Directory. That being said, it is a hugely profitable thing to know about because everybody uses Active yeah. Directory. Um, at Veronis, like uh, like Active Directory stuff, it takes up a lot of our time and attention because it's so prolific and it's such an attack surface. So Active Directory and like Windows hacking stuff is absolutely mm -hmm. where it's at if you know about it. I just um, don't know much about it. That's that's actually why we had uh, Tim on for a while. He was teaching us yeah. about. Windows hacking, PowerShell, like moving up to Active Directory, and um, unfortunately, he got a sick job at AT and T, and now uh, now can't do the stream anymore. But yeah, so there is a playlist on um, PowerShell hacking. Uh, so maybe not exactly what you're looking for, but you can watch a couple of those, and maybe that'll give you a better idea of where exactly. You Need hey everyone! All right, now we can get started because Zam is here. Oh, All right, okay. Zam. The party's starting. Yeah, Zam, we've been covering for you for the last like 13 <laughs> minutes. Like, um, All right. How do you choose the, your next projects to increase your knowledge? Right. So there's two different ways you can do this, um, in in my opinion. One of them is a project that you're already really fascinated in, mm -hmm. uh, fascinated by, uh, that you know that you're going to stick through all the way. I think the worst thing is picking a project that you're not that interested in, and then you end up finding other things that take priority, mm -hmm. and you just drop it. It's a really unsatisfying feeling. So finding a project that you really, really have wanted to do for a long time that motivates you is a good way. Um, the second is if you have to learn something, being flexible with, with mm -hmm. picking a project is really important. I often will find I, I want to learn about Wi-Fi, and I need to learn like Scapy, which is a, allows you to create custom Wi-Fi packets. It's really boring to learn about, and you need to know a lot about networking. Mm -hmm. Well, I would rather learn a tutorial that uses Scapy to do something pretty low level or pretty pretty basic, but still you know mm -hmm. gets me all the information I need in one complete project that's interesting. If I can if I can do a deep dive on something through a project that touches on it, but still has the elements that keeps me interested and from getting bored. My biggest secret, I guess, is just not picking something that's too dry to finish. Because I absolutely hate like taking up a project, finding out it's really technical, and that there's not very much motivation for me to finish, and then just mm -hmm. leaving it and not coming back to it. Yeah. Um, so do we have any plans to poke around Windows 11? Not yet, but uh, I would like to. I think, in fact, we have to. Um, it makes no sense not to. But we're going to be featuring. Yeah, yeah. we're going to be featuring tools that that do stuff to Windows 11. Of course, uh, we always look out for that sort of stuff. I myself don't focus on Windows exactly, mm -hmm. so um, I'm going to be putting my ear to the ground and relying on what other people are telling me in the security community about what's happening with Windows 11. But 
Yeah, I actually I have a, I have a Mac OS, right? I have like Patrick Wardle. <laughs> I can always be like Patrick, like what's going on with Macs? But I yeah. kind of need a equivalent like Windows like PC friends to to do the same thing with. Okay, um, let's go back to comments. Um, what persistence techniques do we use? Um, I, again, I don't do a lot of exploitation stuff. Um, most of what I know is just Metasploit. Um, Metasploit has mechanisms for persistence, and, mm. and really it depends on the target and what you are expecting your issue to be. Like if you think that the connection might be unreliable or the host might be unreliable, you know, there's ways of creating a persistence mechanism. And again, for anybody who's just brand new to cybersecurity has no idea what this question means, when you, mm -hmm. and you can switch my screen for a second, um, you would typically use something like Metasploit to uh, which is a uh, pen testing suite to scan a system, find a vulnerability, mm -hmm. identify the vulnerability, find an exploit for that vulnerability, and then once you exploit that vulnerability, deliver a payload that establishes a beachhead. And that's going to be something that is uh, hopefully persistent mm -hmm. and allows you to connect back to that machine and do a bunch of bad stuff. Now, there's there's all sorts of ways to do this. There's uh, reverse shells. There's, there's just like lots of stuff you can mm -hmm. pick. Uh, to establish a way of communicating with that device and try to fly under the radar and also not trip any antivirus. That is a lot though. And in order to recommend one in particular, I would really need to make sure that it, it as soon as they recommend one, someone's gonna say it tr triggers antivirus or whatever else. And then we get into obfuscation. How do we hide this? Is there a way we can mm -hmm. execute like an obfuscated, like there's just a lot there. So. I would just say uh, there's lots of different ways to do it. It depends on what the difficulties are that you're facing um, when it comes to the the problems of getting a reconnect back on the machine. So it's just one of those mm -hmm. where um, you know I'm sure I would have a specific answer for a specific scenario, but it really depends on what kind of box you're working with and what kind of connection you're trying to establish to it, and also tr how sneaky you're trying to be. Because mm -hmm. if you're just red teaming and you don't care that you get caught, which you kind of should, but let's just say you know you're you. You don't really care you get caught you're doing a basic thing then yeah mm -hmm. like you don't need to put in an extra a bunch of extra work to hide what you're doing but if you are uh instead like tr like a, an adversary that's trying to sneak in you're obviously going to go ab much above and beyond to hide mm -hmm. your backdoor connection and use methods that are highly obfuscated and will never trigger av cool um okay this is an interesting question i haven't even heard about maybe we'll cover it in our news thing is how do you feel about the new german law german law that allows their state security agencies to force ISPs to download <laughs> malware on a target user. So I feel like this is something Michael would love because he loves like Drake. No, and, no. Yeah, yeah. No. So no, no. Let, let me frame it in a way that you would love. All right, Michael, you're you're the government, and you um, have no way of going after these people that are using encryption because your society values uh, you know the ability mm -hmm. to use encryption and have secrets or whatever. Mm -hmm. But you know you have, must have a right to investigate this because you know something bad's going no, here, no. and you have a and you have a court order. A warrant. A warrant. So now, <laughs> yeah, so now because like lawful evil Michael has a warrant, you know, you mm -hmm. are able to target this user who, because of inc modern encryption, is untargetable and download something that will backdoor their system. But as an update. If you had a warrant, that would, in theory, necessitate that you have reasonable suspicion. Uh, enough to get a judge to sign a warrant. Yeah, or someone paid a guy and now they have a warrant. Okay, right, but that's a separate criminal issue that there's corruption in your government, and that's like a separate issue from the fact that well, you're I mean, actually... You can say it's a separate issue, but then when you create a law that allows an, a process that may or may not be corrupt mm -hmm. to target users with something that violates, arguably, right. well, uh, their rights. The, the part know, that it, would rub me wrong the is... Pro well, go on. It is just doing it without the, that person's knowledge. Like... If you had a warrant and you subpoenaed information and, and gathered that, and then like um, there was a process for them t to legally make you not be able to do that, that would that'd be one thing. But if they're like, okay, I can just install, install malware on your computer, and you don't know for three years, like yeah. So my question is, do you are you guys familiar with military grade? Yeah. People, people in the civilian sector use it to try to make everyone think that the military uses the best stuff. So like, mm -hmm. oh yes, this is military grade <laughs> steel. That just means it's a decade the, out of date. No, it means it's the cheapest yeah. bidder. So um, the U, like for the U.S. government, doesn't act like deploy the best stuff. Like, mm -hmm. and I seriously doubt that you know the German, like German law enforcement, is going to be attracting the most talented hackers. So mm -hmm. here's the thing: where where are they getting the malware? Uh, what it like is it from some sketchy company that also sells to you know countries that actually use it for targeting journalists and dissidents 
Um, it, are they part of a supply chain that's like fundamentally corrupt? Like, is this ethically sourced malware? Is this, <laughs> is this malware free range? Um, or is it is it homegrown malware yeah. that you're making yourself? Which again, now you're competing with like like all these other threat actors who are probably more talented and better resourced mm -hmm. than you because like it's not like the German police. It's like you know like Russia's like military hacking unit. And like if you're using an exploit to to go after these people, what's what's to prevent them from A, taking that and just using it to target as many users as they want, or B, connecting mm -hmm. back to the back door that you have created and being able to access everybody that you infect and potentially mm -hmm. compromising your investigations, like like stealing data. It's just when the government tries to hack legally hack other people's mm -hmm. computers, I, I am of the opinion that they do a terrible job usually and usually end up having to turn towards a company that is mm -hmm. ethically questionable in order to get the job done because not like again like the police department doesn't always attract like the best hackers i'm just saying it's not a popular job for people uh who do the sort of thing that we do mm -hmm. so um it's it's in my opinion not a good idea um like legally trying to hack people through the internet service provider um, just makes people mm -hmm. not trust, trust their internet service provider. Right. It doesn't really, like, I don't think it really helps the situation, and it sets a bad precedent, so that's mm -hmm. my opinion. Um, as I said, I believe Michael would favor this law, like, overall. I, I don't, no, I, I would, no, probably not. Mm -hmm. not, the, oh. not the way. Okay. Like, right. usually where I draw the line it is, like, uh, sort of the, the notion that you have to reasonably, reasonably, um, the reasonable expectation of privacy, right? Like, if I'm in my house, I have a reasonable expectation of privacy on what I'm doing. If I'm talking on an encrypted app, I have reasonable expectation of privacy. You know, if I'm in the middle of the street having a loud conversation, I don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy, right? So that's where I generally draw my line on surveillance. But anyway, besides that, um, what kinds of machines do we, uh, <laughs> we use and why? Oh, so I um, the name the network name of my machine is currently Raytheon ThinkPad, but this oh. is a MacBook Pro, mm -hmm. and I use MacBook Pro because I work for people who will buy me a computer. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, I have a MacBook here that I do for some of the production stuff, but we're actually streaming on a Windows machine right now. Um, I use Windows um, because it has better um, compatibility with uh, games and uh, a lot of the programs that I use, and it's just something that I grew up on. So. I mean, I don't really think that one of the OSs is better than the other. Um, so Yeah, Mac OS is Linux-like enough that I can follow along right. with most tutorials without needing to spin up a virtual machine. So yeah, that, that is, is nice. That's not the case for Windows. So for me, like, I'm pretty mm -hmm. comfortable with Mac OS until I have to use a program that's Windows only. Yeah. That, that being up. said... It... Like, a Espressif only like mm -hmm. makes a programming tool for the ESP8266 that only runs on Windows, yeah. which is why I'm limited to using like Python tools instead. Yeah. Um, one really good question... Uh, is doesn't the German government not allow people to scan other devices? Yeah, they don't. Mm -hmm. Isn't that wild? So if you were to just port scan someone in the United States, it's just like you're you're just knocking around. You know, you're not doing anything mm -hmm. malicious. Um, you are just looking, and looking in the United States is not a crime. Peeping mm -hmm. is not a crime here. It's not. So at least on networks. <laughs> so calm down, Michael. Uh, okay. So. Uh, Basically, what this means is, as a U.S. citizen, I can run around and port scan mm -hmm. anybody in the world, and they can't get mad at me because, well, uh, some some military ranges or whatever or government ranges will yeah. be like, "You need to stop port scanning this." And how did you even find about out about this IP address? And mm -hmm. you're just like, because it was one of the theoretical IP addresses that existed in that range. Oh my gosh. Um, but you're allowed to do it. Mm -hmm. In other countries, this is not the case. Port scanning is treated as like an aggressive, like active act. Mm -hmm. So you would, if you lived in like uh, Germany, for example, you would need to get like a Shodan account and look at the results that somebody mm -hmm. else had done. So this is limiting in a lot of ways, and it's also convenient in a lot of ways. The mm -hmm. um, the convenient thing is Shodan has filled a gap where Europeans, you know, or people in, in most European countries cannot do port scanning, and thus they need someone to do port scanning for them who is allowed to. And then they can share their data and everything's fine. So Shodan is mm -hmm. really popular in Germany because, you know, it allows them to instantly see as though they had scanned the host themselves. Now the problem mm -hmm. is you can't do anything custom. So mm -hmm. if you want to you know, port scan something in a certain way or look for a certain service or do something funky mm -hmm. that, that Shonen doesn't do, you cannot do that. It's not legal, which trips me out. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it just trips me out. It's kind of the same debate over like, is it legal to record and decode packets? Mm. I like in the United States, yeah, 
those packets are flying over your property. Those, those <laughs> packets are your property. Like you can you can listen to them all you want. I mean, provided you're not um, doing something like uh, I don't know, like really crazy, like like cracking military uh, communications mm -hmm. or something with like stolen passwords. Like you know, provided you are using um, open source tools and you're you're you know just listening to packets, that's not a problem. But in many other places, it is. Like, intercepting communications is either a crime mm -hmm. or it's something that's, like, very frowned upon. So just the difference between different laws in different countries is really crazy for hackers. Because sometimes I'll be talking to a German hacker about something that I did, and they would be like, mm -hmm. what? Like, how did you do it? And I'm like, this was perfectly legal. He's like, oh, I can't even port scan. Right. So, you know, it, it, it's a lot of differences between different countries. And it's really interesting to see the different businesses that have sprung up to kind of get in the middle and fix this problem, like, uh, not Multigo, uh, Shodan, uh, for this issue in particular. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, let's go to another question from before. Um, Yandex, reverse image search. Do we have any experience with that? Yeah, so let's go over here to Yandex. Um, and so Yandex is uh, the Russian equivalent of Google, and it has a lot of different stuff. Um, available, such as reverse image search. Hmm. Now, I typically use things like TenEye in order mm -hmm. to find like an image or something that I'm I'm trying to find a uh, like a, a larger image of. And in this case, I took a crop in of a Theranos company photo um, that is all over the internet. Like this is like definitely it exists somewhere. So my kind of measurement for this is can if you feed it an image, can mm -hmm. it find uh, like other cropped in versions of the image? Can it find right. other colorized versions of the image? Like, you know, or is it just limited to like the exact image? So, mm -hmm. Tin Eye is really good at like if I take an image and I crop it in, or if I find a cropped in image of a larger one, I can find the full version right. or a higher quality version relatively easily. It's great at that. Um, I think like they might have been talking about facial recognition, which is admittedly slightly different. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, in terms of just like my, my smell test for like, can this find a larger version of this cropped image? It did a terrible job. Uh, it just like found me other crowds um, and they're not even in- Oh, like, it's just like people. Yeah, it's just random people. Like it says mm -hmm. um, no matching images found. So- I was gonna say Google does that as well. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, which is again, unimpressive. So I'm I'm not particularly impressed by it yet. Uh, if you guys mm -hmm. have an example that you think is cool, um, then please let me know, and we can switch away from that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for now, like I just like have not really found um, it to be too super useful or impressive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one guy said um, we should bring back the original Cyber Weapons Lab, just like it started. I miss the theme song and all. Aww. Yeah, Cyber Weapons Lab was a trip. So I actually started Cyber Weapons Lab as an in-person class. I taught at Pasad Pasadena City College mm -hmm. in um, the like STEM area where we had a bunch of science students. We would just do these lectures to attract other STEM students mm -hmm. to cybersecurity and they were really full and they were really fun. So we started recording them and after a while I, I just liked the name that I came up with it. It was just, mm -hmm. we wanted to appeal to like community college students. So when we started up the Nullbyte channel and we were looking for a good name, we just went with it and they really liked mm -hmm. it. They were super impressed. They're like, we insist on like owning the name too. We're like, all right, you can have it. I'll come up with another one. Like, so uh, that's been what the official title of the entire mm -hmm. Nullbyte series for like, yeah, the entire, I, almost the entire time that we've been doing yeah. it. But I mean, if you, if you really wanna, if you really wanna see basically the same thing as a continuation, you could just truck on over to Hack Five. And um, while it doesn't mm -hmm. have the same theme song, I will say that like we've expanded into something that I really like. So I was gonna say, if you go to the Redia YouTube channel, you can find those talks he was talking oh, about. Oh yeah, you can see the original there. talks that inspired uh, that inspired the whole channel. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can see some good talks we did on Linux, networking, hacking, getting into hacking, and like the the difference between white hat and gray hat and black hat hackers. Like, you know, it's all kind of in there. And uh, it was really cool. Uh, we also got a lot of people who are freaking out and uh, yelling at us for um, <laughs> stealing the first episode of Nullbyte. They're like, we saw this on Nullbyte and we know that like you're just stealing. Yeah. I was like, no, this is me. I posted this here before anyone paid me to do Nullbyte. Mm -hmm. So, no. I was gonna say, um... If you go to Nullbyte as well, I think if you scroll all the way to the bottom, we have some of those 
old, really, really old. Yeah, style if you're talking videos. about the original Null Byte ones, those were yeah. videos we shot in hacker yeah, spaces. Yeah, here you here you can see the first. Yeah, we shot three. these in Null Space Labs, which is ironic, but they're not affiliated. Mm -hmm. um, and we just did presentations where we brought in a bunch of um, community college students um, yeah. to the hacker space, filled it up, and then like did talks with different students. It was super fun. It was super mm -hmm. cool. Yeah, I, yeah, I edited all the those first four there. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Um, I've lost track of the chat, so <laughs> you may need to. Uh, um, yeah. Um, I also I have a question for the um, audience yeah. while you're looking. Oh, I, I I can respond to Vic, Victor's question because I think I also have your question in here about the ADSB stuff. Ah, yeah. Um, go on. I'll switch back to my screen. Hold on. Um, so the the main adapter that I recommend would be one of the FlightAware ones. Uh, that's what I have. Um, there's a blue or purple one that um, has the built-in filter. Basically, all it is is an RTL SDR, right? Um, so you can use any RTL SDR. If you have like FM tra radio stations near you, then sometimes you can get interference. Um, and so then you need either the the blue one with the built-in filter or one of these filters. Um, FlightAware also has um, the 1090 megahertz ADS-B antenna. That's what I have right there. Um, if you want to upgrade a little, you can go to the AirNav store. They have the same RTL SDR um, ones, but I think they also do the uh, 978 megahertz. So that's the smaller, like uh, single engine Cessna type planes. Um, but if you really want to go overkill and you just can't be bothered to set up a Raspberry Pi or something like that, then you can get these and just plug Ethernet right into them, and they'll just work. Um, before you buy either of those, I would go to the Flight Radar um, 24 website, uh, Flight Aware, and AirNav websites, and they all have a section where you can um, submit your location and volunteer to give them data. Um, and as a side benefit of that, you get hardware for free from them, um, and then you can just like siphon off that information for whatever use you have as well. Um, and another interesting use you can do is if you do um, have multiple SDRs or you have one of the uh, Kerberos SDRs um, that's like four um, RTL SDRs connected together, you can do this setup where you have the uh, voice data, um, air, air band voice data, ADSB, ACARS is like uh, text messages for airplanes. Um, so you can get a lot of interesting information all all in one little setup like that. Hmm. Yeah, that's really cool. I also <laughs> really like that <clears throat> under certain circumstances you get free hardware. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I'll admit it is pretty hard now, especially if you're in America or somewhere like that. Now, if you're in a, another country, um, it can be easier. If you're outside of Europe and outside of America, um, then you can certainly have a better chance of getting the hardware for free. That being said, they are starting to put the receivers on satellites. Um, they still like coverage in certain like mountainous terrain or places where there's big gaps in coverage. Um, but yeah, still worth a try because it's it costs nothing to try. So, all right, I'm going to answer Chris Ryan's question, but first I have a question for all of you. Um, give me one second to pull this up. Uh, okay, let's switch over to my screen. Um, so this is my question. This is a device that is being designed mm -hmm. and created. I'm uh, also participating in the creation of it. Uh, and it is a Wi-Fi hacking device that is handheld, and mm -hmm. it's kind of obvious what it looks like here. So my question to all of you, and I invite you to vote on my Twitter post I just made, mm -hmm. um, which is at, at Cody Kinsey, um, is what is the name of this device? Uh, what should it be called? There are mm -hmm. two options that are currently leading. It is either a hack boy or a hack held. And you can see there's already some voting that's going on. So <laughs> if you have an opinion on this, yeah. um, please weigh in because the, the fate of this device's hack name boy. hangs in the balance. So um, it's either... Oh, but I could see how that could be like off-putting as far as being genderized. Yeah, but it's based on a device that was already genderized in like the 80s. So like, yeah. are you gonna like go and reinvent it? Like, it's, That's true. You know, it, who, who knows? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna vote one way or yeah. the other. I just wanna know how you feel. What is this device? Is it a hack boy? Is it a hack held? Please let us know. If you have another idea for it also, please throw in a dark horse. I wanna hear it. 
So um, again, this Q and A does mm -hmm. not all the questions going this way. Some of them going out to you as well. So if mm -hmm. you're watching this, please go ahead and vote and let us know what the name of this device is because we are desperately trying to figure it out. All right, we can <laughs> yeah. go away. Uh... And I will link to um, this post as well to make mm -hmm. it nice and easy for everyone to vote. Okay, so um, the question that was asked is um, tips on learning Wi-Fi attacks. I am absolutely passionate <clears throat> about Wi-Fi. Mm -hmm. It's one of those things that seems like magic because it's like spooky action at a distance. It's like you can have an effect on something that's super far away mm -hmm. um, with really cheap hardware and it, it actually works. It, it's really something that's um, not that hard to learn and is super cool. The number one thing to know about getting into Wi-Fi hacking is you can do some basic low-level stuff without knowing anything about networking. Um, but if you want to be good at this and if you want to understand what's going on, really understand what's going on, then you need to learn about networking. Mm -hmm. um, even a routing and switching class will give you 80% of the information you need right. to be able to pick up on what's happening with Wi-Fi hacking because there's a couple like custom special protocols that happen over mm -hmm. Wi-Fi that you can learn about, that you can attack, um, deauthing, um, sending up beacon frames. And mm -hmm. the Stefan's Wi-Fi deauthor, or Space Hoon's Wi-Fi deauthor, um, is a great example of a tool that can let anybody get started with a couple of these properties. Mm -hmm. But once you want to get into the fancy stuff, which I really like to do because I think it's super cool, like kicking a device off a network and forcing them to switch over to yours, mm -hmm. uh, and then like popping up a phishing page. Like you, Stefan and I can create a device that does that, but you're not going to understand how it works because it's doing like DNS spoofing and like mm -hmm. a captive portal thing. And like, you know, we really want people to be able to understand like why this is so cool. And really, the only like requirements are knowing a bit about networking and mm -hmm. probably doing a little bit of reading from researchers who make it really easy to digest. So, a lot of the exploits that we use. Um, or at least many of them that I use, are based on papers by Matthew Van Hoff. Mm -hmm. um, he's a great Wi-Fi researcher that writes excellent papers that are aimed at like the high school level. So if you are in or have graduated high school, like you will be able to understand these papers. Um, they explain the way that Wi-Fi works, the way that this property that he's messing with affects them, and then it can just set your brain on fire for what's possible. An example, mm -hmm. Matthew recently did a paper on how you can use beacon frames, which are supposed to be advertising all the properties of a network that your device could mm -hmm. join. Um, and instead, he's using them as a weapon. If you modify them to have a super slow data rate, you can basically trick someone's device into thinking that the network they're connected mm -hmm. to is so slow that it cannot do anything. So by abusing basically the billboard that's supposed to be up there showing nearby Wi-Fi devices that, hey, this network exists and these are its properties and this is what you need to do to join mm -hmm. it, instead we're modifying one of those properties and saying, and by the way, this is the worst Wi-Fi network in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and your device typically will just believe it and start transmitting data at such a slow rate that it seems as though the network just doesn't work anymore. Like these little things like are absolutely so cool to know because most people that get into hacking like don't know that you can use like beacon frames mm -hmm. as an attack, for example. And for one, being fascinated by this stuff really helps because you're going to mm -hmm. want to read those papers. And when you learn like a new way that you can make billions of devices react mm -hmm. <laughs> like weirdly. Uh, or in a specific way that makes them vulnerable, it's really exciting. And there's still a lot out there in terms of what you can do as like a junior cybersecurity person with this stuff. So mm -hmm. I am part of a team with Stefan who will take one of these uh, things that have been discovered and then try to make it work on a super cheap microcontroller and then turn it into a tool for everyone to use. I myself am not super technical when mm -hmm. it comes to writing the software myself, but I know how it's supposed to work. And between Stefan and I collaborating mm -hmm. with me designing the software and him implementing it, a lot of the time we come up with a really great result that can use some of the Wi-Fi hacking techniques other researchers have mm -hmm. written papers about and instead uh, make a tool that you can download and, and try out for yourself. So, yeah. Um, people are asking. Matty Van Hoff yes. is who you're talking about. Yes, Matty Van Hoff, um, he's a friend of the show. He's been on a couple times. Um, we've interviewed him mm -hmm. uh, at conferences. He's just a really super cool person that does fascinating work. And you can mm -hmm. find all of his papers for free on his website. A lot of academics, like they'll mm -hmm. publish their paper and some third party will like sell it to everyone. He doesn't do that. Like He makes sure that you can download every single mm -hmm. one of his papers I'm talking about. Some of them, um, like why Mac address randomization is not enough, are just excellent, excellent mm -hmm. papers that teach you about the fundamentals of privacy on modern devices and what they try mm -hmm. to do and how easy it is to 
like get around that. And then others are just like straight up yeah. attacks on the Wi-Fi protocol, including WPA3. Mm -hmm. So Matthew is one of the preeminent people studying WPA3 and has already found multiple flaws and had an influence on the way that it's been mm -hmm. created. So he is absolutely the person to be looking at if you want to stay up to date on bleeding edge Wi-Fi stuff that maybe hasn't made the news yet because nobody's implemented it on a wide enough scale to you know mm -hmm. to make the news yet. So um, yeah, uh, sorry, I was gonna say fun fact. Um, if there is an article, a scientific paper behind a paywall that you want access to, there's nothing stopping you from directly emailing the researcher mm -hmm. and them giving you the paper. Um, so don't, if you really want access to a paper, just email uh, the primary researcher and they can give it to you. Um, and they'll be more than happy to do that. Oh, I really like the name Hack Child. Thank you. Thank you, David. Oh, I, I like hack, hack Boy with be with an uh, boy with an eye. That, that is because you have terrible taste. <laughs> that is absolutely never going to be the name. Who wrote that? Did anybody suggest that? Yeah, it was. Whoever uh, suggested that, get out of the chat. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, you're banished. <laughs> okay, we're not gonna ban you this time because I, I, I solicited input, but we are absolutely not naming it Hack Bois. <laughs> Bois. Um, um, so one person says, Cody's gonna be depressed when uh, WEP3 is used. I am going to, well, here's the thing. Mm -hmm. um, you can downgrade almost any connection from WPA3 to WPA2 by just jamming it or causing other issues with it. There are still flaws in WPA3 that can, that can basically allow you to mess with the connection in certain ways that make it really difficult to maintain. And mm -hmm. there are also ways that the attacker can send messages to the router to make it think that the device that's joining it does not support WPA3. Mm -hmm. So if you can basically downgrade the connection that someone is using when they connect to a WPA3 capable router, all my old tricks still work. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's going to be a very long time until there's like WPA3 only routers. So because of that, we can typically still use the uh, the previous mm -hmm. things that we were doing, uh, provided we find enough flaws in WPA3 to just jam or otherwise cause issues with that connection. So oh. downgrade attacks are definitely mm -hmm. possible. So I'm not that sad. I, I thought I was going to be, though. Related question, uh, would endlessly pinging a device drain its battery? Or, or, or I'm gonna add on to it. Like, could you possibly like ping a device and is there a way in the packet to be like, hey, I need you to increase your, your, your uh, gain, like speak louder? Um, so not a ping, but if we're talking about Wi-Fi, there's a way to right. do it. Um, so if you, are, if you are sending out Wi-Fi packets that are just like, hey, I am on the absolute end of your range and like mm -hmm. I can barely hear you and also I'm an old device and also my transmit power is extremely low, mm -hmm. I'm going to need you to speak up. You could definitely target a device and cause it to transmit at its maximum possible power mm -hmm. by just saying that that's what it has to do in order to communicate with the base station. So you could create a malicious access point that you know connects to the device and then just starts absolutely draining mm -hmm. uh, its battery by either it can send it packets that force it to keep its radio on, connected, and broadcasting nonstop. Mm -hmm. So that's one method is just increasing the volume of transmission, and the second would be increasing the power of transmission. So sending it a bunch of packets that say, "Hey, turn." up your radio all the way and then also hey mm -hmm. here's a half form packet whoops i dropped it here's a half form packet whoops and like by continually doing that you can basically mm -hmm. cause the radio to be on all the time which is super battery expensive so yeah it is possible to do this okay um hi guys i'm currently working on a python script that automates the process of making an evil twin access point is it possible to implement ssl stripping uh to make my fake ap yeah, but SSL stripping is complicated. Um, it's really hard to implement SSL stripping transparently. I tend to do just like DNS spoofing or something like, mm -hmm. and try to just redirect them away from one site to another. Um, I would frankly recommend like DNS spoofing if you can get away with it because SSL stripping is complicated and I'm not an mm -hmm. expert in it, but the reason I'm not is because it's not straightforward all the time. Um, somebody else has like a straightforward SSL stripping script they want to drop. Like mm -hmm. I know there's a couple that are out there, but I've used them in the field and I find that they very rarely work without mm -hmm. like substantial setup. Could you elaborate on what a malformed packet is? Yeah, so a malformed packet is a deliberately messed up packet that has information that um, causes the the access point or the the mm -hmm. client it's being sent to to behave in a desired fashion so let's say that we want to create a malformed packet um, like a good example of this is like i think like slow loris does this mm -hmm. where like it'll attempt to like 
it starts a connection and then it starts sending things at the slowest oh, yeah. possible data rate to just like keep it open. So in that case, like it basically figures out how slow it can send a packet and then sends these fragmented packets that are just pieces of packets as slowly as possible mm -hmm. um, on as many threads as possible to just saturate the, uh, the, the client or access point and take up all their capacity just like keeping these connections open. Yeah. Um, there's other types of attacks that will send malformed packets that will uh, you know, saturate it in other ways and, and cause it to crash by just like having a bunch of data that needs to be processed that doesn't mm -hmm. equal anything. Um, so there's there's lots of different ways you can like glitch out or, or modify or fuzz packets to have values that cause the access point to go haywire or the client to go haywire. And mm -hmm. um, that's why like sometimes malforming packets and sending them is something you can do once you know mm -hmm. a little bit about networking to cause uh, just unpredictable effects on uh, whatever you're targeting. Okay, uh, could you talk briefly about reverse engineering? Um, any pointers on reverse engineering? Yeah, pointer. Go talk to Stephane. Malware Tech. Oh, Malware Stephane Tech. Stefan doesn't do well. Stefan does reversing for like like firmware. hardware reverse. Yeah, engineering. for like hardware from well firmware reversing, still software. Yeah. But um, yeah, like uh, Marcus Hutchkins like is doing a very nice series. He's also getting the same like uh, <laughs> pushback on TikTok that I mm -hmm. am. I I made like. A video on TikTok where it's like, my dentist, who shall go unnamed, leaves his Wi-Fi network open, and I can print from his printer and see all the contacts and send faxes as him. Uh, and uh, that video got taken down permanently for harassment and bullying after being taken down for review for a week and a half. Um, and I'm just like, I'm just used to that by now, so I never spend more than about an hour working on a TikTok video yeah. because I know it has like a 50-50 shot of being taken down. But Marcus is so upset. Uh, because like you know, <laughs> he's I, very distraught. I like I am too. Um, like you know, anytime it happens, I'm still just like TikTok sucks. Like it's mm -hmm. so annoying to have people that don't understand cybersecurity being like uh, like the fact that I didn't name who this dentist is and I'm mm -hmm. just like disclosing a very like very benign vulnerability. Uh, it's just like it clearly the people don't get it and they they have people that are working there controlling content that they don't understand. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. But like at this point it's just a systemic problem. There's no way to fix it. You can't talk to someone at Tech Talk. Like it just yeah. it doesn't work. Um, so I, I wish him luck trying to produce content on TikTok because it is really hard. And uh, aside from that though, he has a YouTube channel that has a lot of great reversing mm -hmm. uh, beginner guides. And I think you would get a lot of value out of that. But just a little side story about how hard it is to produce uh, hacking content across multiple platforms. I can get my content in front of, you know, maybe like a half million people on mm -hmm. TikTok, but also a really great piece of content I spent all day working will get taken down for bullying. <laughs> <laughs> for bullying an anonymous yeah. dentist. So uh, so it's, it's really whack uh, trying to be a content creator and do this all over the place. YouTube has gotten a little bit better, mm -hmm. uh, but we still you know, even doing the hackers react scenes, we're taking yeah. down relentlessly. And well, we, and also like with that. we can't do anything that's like phishing or social engineering. We have to be very careful around on YouTube as well. Absolutely. Um, okay, so if you'll have any final questions, we're down to our last couple of minutes. So be sure to drop those in the chat. I'm gonna go over a couple of comments we have from the channel real quick. Um, keep up the live Q&A. You're doing a great service to those who want to explore. Personally, I'd like to see a live interpreter SMB session where the target has an AV on like a vast. There are no solid videos that actually work on YouTube. Do you have a test on this, do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's like it's a very, very specific. It's like quite specific um, yeah. like setups. Like is there did somebody with a vast hurt you? <laughs> Um, you know, we definitely want to do something on Meterpreter. I like Rapid7. Back when we were going to like um, hacking conferences and, and doing uh, like interviewing people, we interviewed a bunch of people that worked at Rapid7, and they all seemed really happy. Mm -hmm. You know, they get sent to conferences, they get to like create interesting tools. So, you know, I would love to like look at some of their stuff and uh, use Meterpreter and just show off what it is because the the whole like kill chain or like the mm -hmm. exploitation chain like is really interesting for beginners to see how the whole shebang works and how this framework has been set up. Also, once you learn how to use Metasploit, like so many other programs are, are modeled after it mm -hmm. and become a lot more accessible, like when you learn how to use a module or do a scan or whatever. So I think, yeah, I think it would be good for us to do a Meterpreter episode. If you guys want a Meterpreter episode, let us know and we'll we'll do it. Although I feel like I don't, like I feel now the meme is Cobalt, Cobalt Strike is what all attackers oh, use and before yeah. it was Meterpreter. But uh, you know, we'll, we'll start with Meterpreter and see where things goes. Uh, asking for a friend. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, okay, this one would be harder, but let's try it. Um, what do we think about the state of the 2022 and 2024 election uh, when it comes to cybersecurity? Um, 
Well, one thing I would say is, is watch the German election, which is coming up. Mm -hmm. Like, that, this is going to be a good bellwether for what's coming up um, in the United States eventually. Uh, but the German election is coming up. Um, Stefan and I have been talking about it a lot. Mm -hmm. It's going to be really interesting because, um, well, just because of all the things we've seen in the United States, like hack data being mm -hmm. leaked, like all sorts of other scandals, like being drummed up in order to discredit people. It's just going to be wild. So... Mm -hmm. um, Personally, I think things are going to be worse. Mm -hmm. um, there's, they've basically kind of proved that there's not much of a response to this. Um, you, this is the best way mm -hmm. to mess with your enemies in a way that they can't really trace well, back to you or like or do yeah. anything about politically because it's not like a traditional sort of war, even though it is absolutely mm -hmm. an active attack. So. Um, yeah, I think it's going to be worse than before yeah. because it's, it's a proven tactic now and they've refined things and there's more resources that have been dedicated mm -hmm. to this. So, um, Well, I think the important point, too, to make there is even um, if they make an attack on, on your election security, even a failure of that attack is still a success because their measure of success is sowing seeds of chaos in your democracy, right? Um, so if you have people doubting the legitimacy of an election then those uh, state actors who launched that attack, that's all they wanted to achieve, right? Is they wanted to sow that chaos and disorder in, in your country. All right, so, so I got yeah. I got a question from Jeremy. Um, recently fell in love with Linux and command line, beginner, network mm -hmm. engineer, career, attending DEF CON this year. Any advice on protecting myself at all times in this dangerous and beautiful environment? Don't take electronics. <laughs> what? Don't, uh, going to DEF CON? Don't take electronics. Yeah, don't don't take your phone or, or whatever. Or take like a burner phone or something. He's talking about the pandemic, dude. DEF CON? Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, so we're going to be at DEF CON and Black Hat, mm -hmm. but we're also keeping a close eye on the Delta variant, and we are scaling things back in terms mm -hmm. of contact. There's really there's really no need to test the efficacy of the vaccine right now. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, we're going to be there. We're going to be doing a lot of things virtually. We're going to be coordinating with villages to try to do hardware hacking, um, like hardware hacking uh, classes that everybody can mm -hmm. participate on, like socially distance. Of course, yes. Like if you like, you know, I, I really with a hybrid event without that many people coming, mm -hmm. like I, like the whole OPSEC thing, like I, I'm pretty, you know, I'll, sometimes I'll bring a different phone. I usually don't. Like I just don't connect to the networks and mm -hmm. like I, I, I try not to do anything too goofy. Yeah. That, uh, like leave my computer open and walk away from it <laughs> for like multiple minutes. Yeah. But, you know, really just like be careful. Um, there, Things are hybrid for a reason and like I uh, am likely to run into many people. So mm -hmm. I will be wearing a mask and I will be hard to spot. But um, there will be points where I will be, you know, engaging with people, whatever, yeah. but in a safe distance and kind of like prearranged. So yeah, like it's gonna be a really weird year. We're gonna be there working super hard at Black Hat and DEF CON, but um, yeah, it's things are not quite back to normal. So just be careful mm -hmm. um, and try to take advantage of some of the of the hybrid things that are going on because yeah, it's just a lot of people in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, what's your favorite Kali hacking tool? Wait, is it legal to go to DEF CON if you are from Germany? Um, I hope so, because I'm bringing Stefan there ASAP. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, I believe it is. Like, if it's not, then you guys you, need to change some stuff. Yeah, I because I went you... to C3, and it was way crazier than DEF CON. And that was in Germany, in Leipzig. Mm -hmm. So I think I think you're fine. Yeah. Yeah, I would just highly recommend people that are attending in person be vaccinated. Uh, and hello to Brazil. Yes. Hello to all of Brazil, but especially Nathaniel. Um... Okay, this um, VPN chains in Android. Is that a question or a statement? How to set up? Oh, I don't know. I use a. I I just use a. Same, just like, use the one. I VPN. just use one or two VPNs yeah. if I need to, or I'll use a like a VPN to Tor or Tor to VPN, mm -hmm. whatever you know. Like, um, but I don't really do VPN chains. Sorry. Yeah. Um, one question was uh, before you wrap up, what language is most important for a good cybersecurity expert? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so that again, it totally depends on what you're focusing on. If you're a generalist like I am, Python will serve you well because you mm -hmm. can interact with APIs, you can like bodge other people's code. I would say for learning, um, then C was really helpful for me, and I use it all the time mm -hmm. in Arduino and electronics, and it, it's really helpful if that's what you want to get into. So if you want to mess around with electronics, then C and then after that, Python will be a breeze to learn. Mm -hmm. If you just want to be able to, uh, to interact with APIs and you're not going to be doing much programming, but you don't want to be left out of all the fun, Python. You know, it's a, it's mm -hmm. a little bit of a messy language, and it lets you make a lot of mistakes and is very forgiving. It won't make you a great programmer, but it will mm -hmm. allow you to make prototypes that are good enough, if kind of ugly, to prove a point. Mm -hmm. All right. I think we're basically out of time, unfortunately. 
Uh, yeah, no, it looks like we're about there. So, all right, everyone, um, thank you so much for participating in the chat today. Mm -hmm. I always enjoy these Q&A sessions. If you didn't already vote, I'm going to drop the link again. Oh Please tell us what the name of this device is. If we switch over uh, to my screen, you can see this is the device. What is it called? If you have a different name, like the hack child, I'm perfectly fine with that. But mm -hmm. please, go ahead and on this Twitter poll, which is heating up, by the way. Looks, let, let's see the, the recent results. Um, please let us know if this should be the hack boy, the hack held, or the, uh, oh my gosh. Um, so people are already, it's not about, it's just about a previous product. Nobody, Nintendo would own too much trouble with the trademark. Yeah, this, see, there's a, there's a great, the mm -hmm. pwn, the pwn boy, stay golden pwn boy. Yes. Pwn boy. Hack blah. Who is this? Yes. Yes. No. We need to upvote that. No. It is not going to be the hack blah. Stop suggesting this one. <laughs> but uh, if, if you have any suggestions besides this, I'm not married uh -huh. either. You know, I don't care. A hundred well, people have voted. 23 hours see, left. We have to get around the trademark somehow. Who? About what? I'm sorry, what? Hack boy? If, if it's hack blah, then they can't trademark that. It's a, it already doesn't have the whole first word of game. I think we're fine on trademark. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, all right. So if you haven't already voted, please let us know. If you're, uh, again, dark horse, uh, dark horse entries that are not hack bois, please <laughs> drop, them, uh, drop them there. And we will see you guys next time. If you want to check out mm -hmm. some other great Vernus content, you can always check out the Vernus brand account that has the threat update show, which will tell you what's going on with real companies who are up against security threats and how they're reacting to it. And you can also catch us on, oh my gosh, is it Wednesday today? No, no today's Tuesday. All right, usually we do the usually yes. we do the Q and A on uh, Wednesday, Wednesday, but we did a little early this week. Um, but you will also catch us on uh, Friday. No, fr Friday. Yes, Fri we Friday live stream Tuesdays our... and Fridays, and then every other Wednesday. Yeah, are we are we doing something for Wednesday this week? Yeah, we'll we'll have a live stream for tomorrow. Yeah, we're gonna be again back again tomorrow. So it was a little weird this week. We went live a little earlier than usual, but we'll mm -hmm. do another one tomorrow, which uh, will hopefully be on some of the new cool Wi-Fi hacking stuff that Stefana have mm -hmm. been working on. And then also we'll have another stream on Friday. So we'll see you guys then. Thank you so much for hanging out in the chat and for voting on mm -hmm. this poll. For and we'll see you boy. next time. Bye.